Thank you so much for being here. This is a care collab together with Todd's Tropicals on Darwinara Charm Blue. Unfortunately, mine is not in bloom. However, care collabs happen when other channels get in touch with me saying that theirs is in bloom, is about to bloom, and then I can hustle up some other channels to get together and do a care collab. So thank you very much Todd's Tropicals for giving me the heads up, getting a date coordinated so that we get to see some blooms. If you are here and you're going to watch and listen to how I care for my Darwinara charm without blooms, I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much because my conditions are so much different to Todd's Tropicals, who probably has the perfect conditions for this orchid. And yet here she is in southern Spain with a very, very dry and hot climate for like six months of the year. And when I say that dry, I mean 30% humidity, with parents of being Neophoenicia falcata and Basque stylus Tam Yuan He. When you hear a stylus, that means somewhere in its parentage, there was a Rinko stylus of sorts. And Rinko stylus like it hot and humid. I can do the hot, I can't do the humid. I may need to up my averages if next year is a repeat of this year. So my humidity average of this year is 45% so far, which is pretty incredible considering that I have normally to contend with hot, dry winds right at the beginning when the spring shifts to summer season and the whole temperature change comes to play. And suddenly I get these massive winds for several days on end and my humidity drops down to 20, 18% and at 30 degrees Celsius. So I have mine in a semi-hydro setup, even though it doesn't look like it, because for the three years now that I've had my Darwinara charm, I've got a lot of moss growing in there. And I'm keeping that moss. That moss is my little helper. And yes, Lekka and self-watering. It works. For me, in my super dry climate, it works. I have to be a little bit more cautious in the winter, but I can manipulate the climate of the pot by keeping it on the drier side, even though I never let the microfiber in the pot dry out. It always remains a steady dampness, and I do not leave a reservoir in the pot for this orchid during the winter. How I keep the microfiber damp is just by flushing the pot, and as it's not growing much, it doesn't get much fertilizer either during the winter. Maybe 100 parts per million, through a flush, no more. But basically, I try not to have my LECA build up any salts over the winter. And it is about carrying the roots through the cooler climate because where it lives in my dining room during the winter, the temperatures can drop to 14 degrees Celsius, which, as the parent of Neophoenicia falcata, it has no problem with. So cool is fine. The hot part could be difficult. So I'm growing this as an intermediate and the only thing I need to be cautious of throughout the winter is to make sure that the roots in the pot do not decline. And for that reason, it just gets an occasional flush to maintain the microfibers and not lose the wicking efficacy of the LECA. The first year that I got it, of course, it was much, much smaller, probably around down to here. And I babied it. I kept it in the shade. I didn't push the culture at all. The first 12 months, I primarily focused on acclimating the orchid into my environment. The second year, I thought, right, let's see what we can do with this orchid. And I pushed the light levels and had her on my east side shelf. And she promptly bloomed for me, which was amazing. I was surprised. She was so itty bitty, but she did bloom. Beautiful, beautiful, purpley, neo Phoenicia style blooms. They, they were absolutely stunning, I must say, even though the spike wasn't very abundant. is a first time bloomer, but it was really nice to see. This orchid is already blooming size. Now that I had cracked it to get it to bloom, I figured that this year, what I'm going to do is just let it live in my blooming alley, which is southwest facing, but it has a trellis, and then there is white curtains around the trellis to even block off more of the direct harsh sun. So in the summer, the angle of the sun is really high in the sky that it gets really bright light through the reflecting walls, which are all white, but no direct sun at all. And then as the angle of the sun changes, depending on the season, it will get direct sun and then a little bit of dappled shade and sunshine, depending how the sun is in the sky. And I thought, 
based on the fact I had it on my east side the previous year and it bloomed, now that it has bloomed once, all I need to do is make sure that it blooms again and again and again and I don't have to push it with such extreme light levels as on the east side. I was very wrong. My orchid did not bloom this year because she was in my south facing blooming alley, but much more shaded than the east side ever is, despite the fact I have a white curtain on the east side rack protecting any orchid there from direct sun. Which brings me to the realization that this orchid needs strong light level from the get-go. The Neo parent doesn't want that much light in the summer, but the Vasco Stylus parents wants that bright light in the summer in order for it to bloom. Neos normally like to have it more shaded and very, very bright light in the winter. Well, here we go. This is now a question of me next year. I'm gonna put it back on the east side and see if it will then bloom for me. So I have to consider how strong the Vasco Stylus and the Rinko Stylus parents are in its lineage for this orchid to bloom on the regular basis every year. Lesson learned, if you have one and it's not blooming, give it the maximum light that you can give it without burning the leaves for as long as a time period during the day as possible. I am blessed that I am here in Southern Spain and for that reason, sun is not a problem. The opposite is true is the humidity and rain is a problem. I do not get any rain from the months of May through September, possibly October even. So I have to do a lot of misting, a lot of humidity compensation. That is why the moss is very welcome. And the misting with my sprayer helps with the microclimate around the orchid itself. And that is why LECA and self-watering works for me as well. But you can also see how dangerous it can get to be having to mist so regularly because you can see that I had an issue in the crown. That little leaf there. Yeah, I thought I had lost the growing point of the crown and I was gutted. But I put a nice dollop of dragon's blood into the crown there and she is picking up even though we can see where the stress was while the leaf was trying to develop here we have now got another leaf coming out in the center the crown has been saved so that is a close call with the misting for the microclimate when it gets hot and very very windy I do not mist her on days where there is no wind because there is nothing here I have to compensate for because of the self-watering and the humidity that the lecker beads will give off from the pot itself. But the hot winds in July that I had end of June through July, there was about three weeks. I was actually quite worried with regards to how much oregano my orchids would be reduced to if I didn't keep up with the misting. And I went a little bit too far. This happened, but we got away with it. She's still growing. She's also maturing or growing, working on, however you want to call it, two fans which is a wonderful and welcoming sight because they were not affected by the misting. I must say, if anything was gonna go down, I was actually thinking, well, that's the fans gone as well. But they, she's been working on these fans since last year. And that is, of course, a beauty of having an orchid as it matures and it gets fans. It has a neo Venetia parent in it. It actually becomes bigger and bushier. It is a very, very slow grower for me. I do have to say that I don't find this to be as fast as another Neo Phoenicia falcata that I have just grows like a bush. And I got that Neo at the same time as I got my Darwinara. So I find it to be much, much slower. And there it is again, the Rinko Stylus parent in the background. Because according to my opinion, Rinko Stylus aren't fast growers. Needless to say, I have never successfully grown a Rinko Stylus in my collection simply because I couldn't keep up with their requirements for humidity. And they aren't as fast a grower for me here in my climate because it gets far too cold in the winter for them. The Neophenicia parent having it in this Darwinara is the one that makes it really happen for me in my climate. And for that reason, I can grow this, but I just have to be more cautious with how I mist and how I go about it. And of course, give it more light. So I mentioned my winter fertilizing next to nothing to 100 parts per million, but only through flushing, nothing in the reservoir. Right now, in the middle of summer, she is getting 300 parts per million every time she absorbs the reservoir, which is not that fast. So I do go in between to flush her with plain RO water just so that there is no salt buildup in the pot. And I maintain that exchange of oxygen flow inside the pot so that nothing becomes stale or stagnant 
And then I do toss out the old fertilized water that is still in the reservoir and refresh it with new, but 300 parts per million. And in my case, 5.8 pH, because my LECA stores at 8 pH in the water bucket. I reduce the pH down to 5.8, and then I guesstimate that by the time it goes through the pot, reaches the top, that it balances itself out to about 6.3, 6.5. And let me qualify, my winter flushes are always at 6.3 because there's nothing in the reservoir. So I flush through straight away at 6.3 to find the happy medium of the pH where all nutrients can be absorbed in a balanced way. So unfortunately, no blooms from my Darwinara Charm Blue this year of 2021, but she is growing really well. I have gotten around and been forgiven for a very close call up here, thanks to Dragon's Blood. She is maturing and working on two additional fans, which makes me hopeful. And well, you see the root that is trying to grow in true stylus style in my climate, it just dries off. So that's there's no way I can put this one in the pot, but she did produce some wonderful roots early in the season. One went into the moss and into the pot and the other one went into the moss, came out the other side and stopped growing because of the lack of humidity but I got one to go in and that is all I need, plus the other ones that I would be doing very, very well in the pot because I do not see any deterioration on the vellum up here at all. And you can see even how one is hydrating over there. Yes, oh, let me just say one more thing. The blooms are fragrant. They do have a Neophenicia fragrance to them. A very, very obvious fragrance of the citrus powdery and they are fragrant during the days. I can vouch for that because of my blooms of last year. I hope that 2022, we shall see a beautiful spike, maybe two, because by that time she's big enough. The last spike was down here and she's grown all this. So two spikes, that is absolutely feasible for next year. I will be happy with one spike. I hope that this video was helpful, useful, gave a different perspective of how uh, Darwinara can be grown. Thank you very much, Todd's Tropicals, once again. I am gonna go and find your video ASAP. I want to see those blooms again, even if it is from the other side of the pond. Thank you, everybody, for watching, for sticking around, seeing a plant in a pot with no blooms. Really, really appreciate your time. If you have any questions or anything that I mentioned and I didn't circle back to that subject matter in enough detail, please, Leave your questions in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to qualify and elaborate on what I missed out while I was talking about other things. Your time is appreciated. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.